So we're going to get started with Forrest's talk in a second here. Um, again, please throw your questions for him into the Q&A box so that um, Judy can ask them at the end. In the meantime, I am very happy to present to you the Nats CEO and President Judy Gradwell. Hi, Judy. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and happy California Biodiversity Week. Over the past few days, we've joined with California Fish and Wildlife and California State Parks in a celebration of the diversity that makes our state remarkable. And we hope that despite the heat and the fire, you've had a chance to get out and connect with nature this week, whether in a park or your own backyard. Uh, regardless, we're thrilled to have you here at tonight's talk. I'm uh, Judy Gradwell, President and CEO of the San Diego Natural History Museum. And even though our building in Balboa Park is closed for the next few months, our science never stops. And from more than 100 homes throughout the county, our museum staff and volunteers continue to research, conserve our region, and uh, seek new ways to connect our community with the incredible biodiversity that surrounds us. And the tickets that you purchased tonight, the donations, the Facebook shares, all help support that work. So we thank you for helping to keep our museum alive while our doors are closed. We hope to reopen next year with a new blended model of exciting on-site, online, and nature-based activities. In the meantime, we'll continue to bring natural history to you at home. Next Wednesday, we will hear from Ken Catania about the research behind his new book, Great Adaptations, Starnose Moles, Electric Eels, and Other Tales of Evolution, Mysteries Solved. That sounds like, <laughs> I'm glad to have the mysteries solved. Ken's tech talk will provide a whimsical journey of scientific discovery showing how there is much to learn from studying nature's most astounding animals and evolution's quirkiest adaptations. And you can register in advance at, uh, at our website. The 2019-2020 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation and media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial counties. And we are very grateful to them for their support. For tonight's talk, we're honored to hear from a scientist who studies one of the most diverse biodiverse ecosystems on Earth, coral reefs, as well as the staggering diversity of viruses. I uh, scouted Forrest at a nerd night uh, a few months ago and knew he was the perfect partner for an evening about biodiversity. And so I'm very pleased to welcome him to our screens tonight. Dr. Forrest Rohr is a fellow of the American Academy of the Advancement of Science, uh, American Academy of Microbiology, and professor of biology at San Diego State University. He led the development of vir viromics, which involves isolating and sequencing RNA and DNA from all the viruses in a sample. From this data, it is possible to determine what types of viruses are present and what functions they are encoding. Forrest uses this to study ecosystems ranging from the human body to coral reefs and has shown that most genomic diversity on the planet is viral. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and has won numerous national and international awards and is listed as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. He has also published two books, Coral Reefs in the Microbial Seas and Life in Our Phage World. Welcome, Forrest. All right, so these are the main take home points that I'm going to argue um, as I go through this talk. Um, the, the main point, of course, is that viruses are everywhere. Um, we think of them as the most common predators in the world. There's about uh, 10 million viruses per mil of seawater and uh, about 10 to the ninth viruses per gram of soil and sediment. And that's everywhere we look. Um, they're also the most abundant life forms associated with uh, animals. So you yourself have literally uh, trillions of viruses living either in your guts, on your skin, on your teeth, and they're also living inside your cells. There are uh, hundreds, I mean, sorry, thousands uh, to tens of thousands of species of viruses in each individual person. And Globally, we think that there's uh, something like 100 million species of viruses, 
and most of which are completely uncharacterized. And I'll take you through how we actually know that and kind of how we study the biodiversity of viruses in general. So where do we get these numbers from? The viruses are uh, really um, the, the main way that we know how many are out there is microscopy. And this gives you just an example. So you can take a, this would be like a seawater sample from the ocean around San Diego. We go out, we get, gather a sample and we pull it uh, through a very small, uh, through a filter that's got holes so small it can actually uh, retain the viruses and let the uh, uh, water through. And then we stain those uh, filters um, for DNA. And that lets us count directly the number of viruses in the sample. So here you can see these little, uh, the, the bigger dots are the bacteria or the archaea and the smaller dots are the viruses or the virus-like particles. And roughly speaking, there are about 10 viruses for every cell in every ecosystem that we look at. This is a, uh, a more consolidated version of this um, where we've done, uh, we've taken all of the samples and uh, that we have from all over the world and just made a guesstimation of how many viruses are on the planet. And the total number is somewhere about five times 10 to the 31. And that number, of course, means very little to anybody. To give you a fill, there are maybe 10 to the 23 uh, stars in the universe. So there's a lot more viruses than there are stars in the universe. There are so many viruses that even though they're vanishingly small, if you laid them end to end, they would reach all the way to the Andromeda galaxy and back again. So there's a lot of them out there. What's probably more astonishing about this number is that that method that I showed you for counting the viruses actually misses a large number of them. So the single-stranded DNA viruses and the RNA viruses are probably not accounted for in these numbers. And they could be as many of them as there are of the main DNA viruses that we do count. The other thing is, as I like to point out, is that actually most of the viruses are in the sediments. So their sediments are arguably the biggest biosphere on the planet. And we uh, see about almost 90% of the viruses that we've uh, identified are in sediments. Now the question is, why are there so many of them? And the, the answer is, is that for the most part, they're eating the most abundant cells out there. And the way this works is that um, primary production, so plants and, uh, and trees, I, sorry, plants and algae, do photosynthesis and that produces sugar, which is then made into organic matter. And collectively, um, there's this pool that we call the dissolved organic matter pool. And the dissolved organic matter pool consists of sugar and sugar-like molecules that are directly released by plants and other primary producers, as well as all the breakdown products uh, from the food web. So as things defecate, and as things die, they get broken down and end up in the dissolved organic matter pool. And the dissolved organic matter pool is by far the largest uh, food source on the planet um, for, for um, living organisms. So dissolved organic matter and dissolved organic carbon in particular, which would be like sugar, um, is only really accessible to the heterotrophic bacteria. And so the bacteria are coming in and eating that. And then there are two predator guilds that eat the bacteria, which are the viruses. Um, and viruses that eat bacteria are, so, are also called bacteriophage or just phage. Um, I'm just gonna use uh, viruses as I go through. And then there's the protists, which are uh, things like amoebas and cilia that go around and eat the uh, bacteria also. And so these guys, uh, because the viruses are targeting this, uh, these, all of these cells that are eating this uh, really abundant food source, that means that we get a lot more of them than everything else. 
Now, what we do know is that most of the viruses out there are um, the ones that actually target the bacteria, just because there's common, um, they're so much more common than the other parts of the, uh, the, the other domains of life. The other thing that's interesting about the viruses, of course, is that they don't just act as predators. So the way that a virus, all viruses behave is that the first thing they do is they float around in the environment until they can run into a cell that they can infect. So it's basically the virus is floating around and it's kind of smelling. It's using uh, different proteins to find the right cell and it'll stick to that cell and that's a step called absorption. And when it finds the right cell, then it can inject its nucleic acid, either DNA or an RNA, and do an infection. And then classically, when we're thinking of them as predators, what happens is that the virus then um, goes in, takes over the cell, and it produces a whole bunch of copies of its genome, a whole bunch of copies of the structure, the uh, structural elements to make the new virus, and then it'll blow the cell up. And that's what we call the lytic cycle. But most viruses, we think, also have the option of doing something which is the temperate or the lysogenic life cycle, where they, after they do the absorption and the infection cycle um, or steps, they can enter a cell and they can become part of the cell and they can replicate with the cell um, by usually by integrating their genome into the host genome. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's the most common. And when that's uh, the virus that's integrated into the host genome is called a provirus or a prophage, if it's a bacteriophage. And they replicate with as the host uh, cell uh, uh, replicates. And then under some um, sort of condition like DNA stress, uh, they will be, they can re-enter the lytic life cycle and then produce virions. Just to give you a feel about how common this parasitic uh, part of the viruses are, is that probably almost every cell in the world has at least one provirus. And cells like us, like in a, a, our human cells, have many of them, like lots and lots of different viruses. You can argue that there are actually more viral genes in our genome than there are human genes. Okay. Now, studying the viruses is a little tricky, right? Um, the main problems, of course, is that they kind of, they do have some wonderful shapes. Um, everybody, this is just different EMs of different viruses out there. But the shapes tell us very little about what's actually one virus versus another. They're also very hard to culture, and that's because you not, it's very hard to raise the cells that you're going to culture them on. And even once you've done that, now you have to uh, come up with conditions where the cell can live and you can get the virus to replicate on it. So actually culturing them in the lab is very difficult. They don't have any universal uh, DNA marker. So cells all have ribosomes and we can use that to classify them. Viruses don't. They're so diverse that there's nothing that every virus has. So um, there's no way to actually use uh, things like targeting um, the, the ribosomes like we would with cells. And then there's just so many of them. So the way that we approach this is basically shotgun sequencing the DNA without culturing. And that's what is called metagenomics. And I'm gonna go through it a little, but the idea is, is that you just take a sample, you isolate the viruses away from everything. Um, you isolate the DNA or the RNA, I'll show you a little bit of that. And then um, you just randomly cut it up and you start sequencing it to just get the A, T, Cs and Gs and then comparing that to databases to see what sort of uh, viruses you had in your sample. And this is for everybody in San Diego. Um, the, the real start to this was actually here in San Diego and particularly off Scripps Pier. So the first sample that we ever did, we just took off the end of Scripps Pier. Uh, we went through a whole bunch of uh, different steps to uh, get the virus, uh, to get the viruses away from all the cells. And then we just randomly sequence 
to figure out what was there. Okay. And then we started doing that for the next uh, two decades. So roughly speaking, this is what my lab does. We get a ship and it depends on where the, we're going in the world. Sometimes we get a super yacht and sometimes we get really bad, not very nice ships. Then we go and we collect water underwater, which is uh, in the case of a coral reef, we'll go down and we'll actually uh, suck the water right off the coral surface. In other cases, we'll, uh, we've sampled up against glaciers, or sorry, off icebergs where we will suck water off there. Of course, we do other things like just drop down uh, CTDs, which are uh, an ocean oceanography uh, method for gathering a whole bunch of water. Uh, different things of that nature. So there's, a, of course, a whole variety of ways that we collect samples. And then we go through all of these steps to really filter out everything. So remember, the viruses are the smallest, so we can actually capture most of the cells by using uh, filters and letting the viruses pass through. And then we'll concentrate the viruses using a combination of centrifugation and different filtering techniques. And then viruses are, uh, for the most part, they just have protein and DNA. So you can use a density centrifugation. So this is because they don't have lipids in them for the most part. You can get them to go to one particular um, place in a density centrifugation tube and pull them out. And then we take all of those uh, viruses and we um, isolate the DNA and prep it for sequencing. And then we run it on, uh, nowadays, of course, a next-gen sequencer uh, like uh, Illumina's um, sequencing. We mostly use uh, Illumina anymore. And then finally, we do a whole bunch of computer work to actually figure out what do we figure out, what do we actually find. And that's a combination of bioinformatics, uh, statistics, and ecological modeling to really understand what's going on here. So that's the, the overall um, approach. When we do all of this, um, what we found initially and what we're still finding is that somewhere uh, up to about 30% of the sequences that we identify um, are match something in the database. And by this, I, these are very, we use a very loose criteria. So we just mean that They've seen there's a piece of DNA that's in the database that has some similarity to what we're finding. Okay? It really doesn't mean that we know anything about that DNA other than it's been seen before. What's striking about the viruses is that even using these loose criteria, about 70% of what we find are complete unknowns. And that remains the same today even though there's been this massive uh, uh, sequencing ever effort since 2002, right? So it really hasn't changed. The only places that we're starting to see this number of the knowns going up is in seawater and in the human microbiome. And that's because so much effort has been put into that part of it. Now, this is what we think the most abundant viruses on the planet are uh, based on those known ones that we find in the metagenomes. So the uh, most common are these T4-like myophages or myoviruses, and they're kind of the, the beautiful um, phage where you have uh, this, the capsid, the top part here is the head where the genome is, and then this structure here is to inject the genome into the cell. And then these tail, uh, these tail fibers they're called, that's so that when, remember when the virus is trying to find a place to infect, it's reaching around, it's tasting with those sorts of things. Um, the uh, next most abundant genotype that we find or gene, a broad uh, viral group that we find are the lambda-like and they look like this. And then the uh, T7-like ones, which have very shorter tails. Okay? And to tell you the truth, we're really honestly just finding completely new groups of viruses all the time. 
So this is just uh, a smattering of uh, our best guess of what's out there, but this may be totally replaced by one of these novel viral groups um, in the future. Okay. Now, the nice thing about metagenomic data is that you have all these random uh, fragments of DNA and you can take and you can just ask, if I have one piece of DNA uh, from a sample, do I ever see another piece of DNA that matches up? So remember, you've just got the, the ATCG code and you can just say, do I get the same order? And if that happens, that tells you that you've resampled um, the same virus. So the more times that you see where these line up, the lower the diversity of the sample. Okay. And you can do that with, uh, within a sample or between samples. And you can use that and some, uh, and some fancy math to really predict how many different viral species or what we call genotypes are in the sample. Okay. And when we do this for uh, uh, globally, what we think is going on is that there are probably about 100 million um, different viral species out there, somewhere in that range. And, um, and encoded by those, uh, those uh, viruses, there's probably about 2.5 billion unique gene groups. So as you can see, it's a real challenge, right? And these numbers are relatively stable um, uh, over a long period of time. So I don't think that they're going to change dramatically. Okay. All right. As of now, we've, pro we've directly observed maybe uh, a quarter of a million of these uh, different viruses. So we know that there are all of these ones out there from the metagenomics when we uh, take the metagenomes and we just start putting together genomes to say this is what this particular virus is, um, we're only at about a quarter of a million. So we still have a lot of sequencing and work to do. And like I said before, most of the viruses that we have observed are really from the upper ocean and from human associated uh, microbiomes. Now, the question becomes, if you have this massive uh, uh, viral biodiversity, where is the most biodiverse regions for these things? And it really looks like sediments um, is the, the main place that most of the biodiversity for viruses are. And so one of the early places that we actually sampled was Mission Bay uh, right here in Fiesta Island. And we uh, estimate in that in one kilogram of sediment from Mission Bay, that there's somewhere between 100,000 to a million different species in just one kilogram of sediment. There's a way of measuring diversity. There's lots of ways of measuring diversity, but when you're talking about diversity, it's not just the number of species, it's how evenly uh, the species are distributed in the samples. Um, and when you do this, the one we prefer is something called the Shannon Index, uh, which is H prime here. And what we see is that these uh, sediment samples have very large, uh, very high diversities, about nine in the Shannon Index. To give you a feel, like everybody talks about how diverse beetles are, they have a Shannon diversity globally of maybe about three. Okay. So that's the viruses are very diverse and they're much more diverse than everything else that's been ever observed. So what about viruses in hyper biodiverse ecosystems? And so these are uh, numbers that we've gotten from different samples. So in rainforests um, and other soils, the Shannon index uh, for, uh, for the viruses is about five. And uh, for sediments, it's about nine. And then, of course, my favorite one are coral reefs. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the coral reef sampling and how we've uh, uh, looked at viral diversity as well as diversity of everything else on the reef. Um, and the way we do this is we use um, these things uh, called ARMS. So they stand for Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures. And really, all they are are these piles of PVC that, um, that create little hotels for different organisms uh, to crawl into and settle and become uh, 
part of the arm structure. Um, and we go and we stake them out on reefs um, all over the world. There are about 5,000 of them that have been deployed. And the idea here is to create a standardized system so that um, uh, even though we're not getting all of the diversity of the reef, we're getting this, uh, we're using the same thing in on different reefs all over the world so that we can ask, are there different uh, higher or lower diversity? All right, so this is what we get um, on these. You just get uh, literally, you know, thousands of different little crustaceans and snails and all these cool little crawly things, crabs and so forth. And then, of course, you get all of the um, uh, sessile things like ascidians and corals and sponges and so forth will set onto the, the uh, PVC settlement systems also. And it does vary depending on uh, where you're looking in the arms. So you get different things on the top part of the arms than you do in the middle, etc. And then finally, of course, um, all of those things have viruses and bacteria on them. And since we're biologists, what we do is we take all of these beautiful things and we just scrape them all together and uh, grind them up so that we can uh, look at their DNA and find out what's there. So that's how we get the number of species. And we're also going to look at the molecules that they're, in, uh, they're carrying uh, really uh, to get an idea of potential uh, uh, therapeutics that might be on the coral reef. So what we found using this is that there are about 2.5 million species of, uh, of the animals and plants uh, that we've processed so far. There are roughly speaking um, 10,000 species uh, per on each arm, and that becomes uh, important in a little bit. And when we go to the richest place, so the most uh, diverse place uh, for coral reefs, which is Indonesia and the Philippines. This is kind of um, the numbers that we get. So this is again at the Shannon diversity and it's about six all in this area. So this is the coral triangle if you're familiar with this. So these guys are actually, uh, uh, this area is uh, some of the richest, uh, most biodiverse uh, places on the planet. And they are about an order of magnitude to two orders of magnitude more diverse than a, uh, a rainforest. Just to give you a feel, people often compare coral reefs to rainforests. Um, rain, rainforests, as far as we can tell, are actually um, not as diverse as a coral reef. Um, using this data and some relationships called the species a area relationship, we estimate that if we were to get about 100,000 arms, we would capture about 95% of the world's coral reef diversity on these, uh, on these arms. And in this case, I'm really talking about the bigger things, uh, the metazoans and the, the uh, primary producers. What about um, the viruses? So in this case, we get uh, viral diversity on coral reefs is about uh, nine which is similar to the sediment. Um, we may find that there are more uh, viruses on coral reefs because there's all of the ones associated with what uh, the, the coral animal and the, all the other diversity of the animals on the coral reef, um, which we call holobiont. So everything associated with an animal, for example, is a holobiont. Um, that being said, the deep sea actually has amazing biodiversity of animals. Um, so whether it's going to be the deep sea or it's going to be coral reefs uh, really does uh, remain unknown at this point. Those are the two uh, most likely biodiverse or the highest biodiversity on the planet. The other thing that, um, that we look at, of course, is not just the diversity, the genetic diversity that's encoded by the viruses and the uh, bacteria and the animals and so forth. We're also looking at chemical diversity. And this is um, uh, run mostly with a, a uh, lab at UCSD, Peter Dorstein's. And the idea here is to just go into those samples and then um, extract uh, 
organic molecules and then run them on an LCMS uh, system and just see how many different types of uh, uh, chemicals we see in the sample. And the take home message from this is that um, really kind of surprising I think um, to us was that most of the chemical diversity is actually endemic and only in small areas. So each reef has a whole bunch of endemic molecules living on it. Um, and those are different from reef to reef, even reefs that are in the same region like the Coral Triangle. So really it's gonna, uh, if we're interested in these as natural products, um, not only do we have to look on all these different local levels, um, if we're gonna preserve these sorts of reefs and or uh, restore them, uh, we really need to come up with methods to do this. So this is um, what we're doing right at the moment. Um, as you probably know, coral reefs are um, in a lot of trouble. This is just some of the projections for the heating that will happen um, uh, and, help, and actually cause the corals to bleach and maybe even to, and often to die. And these are how the red zones are places where the corals would bleach and probably die as we move into the future with uh, climate change. And so what you can see is that, that all over the world uh, where coral reefs are, uh, there is a really need to come up with ways to not only conserve, but actually restore and possibly move them. So what we're doing is building off the Coral Reef Arcs project, which is uh, where we deploy those arms. And so I told you, if we co collect 100,000 arms, we would probably capture most of the diversity of the, the coral reefs around the world. So we're taking these arms, or what we're proposing to do is take arms that have been uh, uh, out there and being colonized for uh, three to five years, then moving them to these superstructures, which are called, uh, we call coral reef arcs, and then moving the arcs to um, safe places. Uh, so this is where the heating won't be as bad, uh, places where we won't get as, more, uh, as much storm damage from uh, increased uh, hurricanes. Um, in particular, we're thinking places like seamounts where we can move them way offshore and away from people. And we would hopefully create um, these, uh, what we call arc parks, which are just a whole bunch of floating coral reefs. Um, that will allow us uh, to capture most of the d diversity and then hopefully become sustainable where one coral reef arc is, um, is actually called uh, 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 seeding another one. And then the, uh, we're also working on then can you take one of these coral reef arcs and then move it back onto a degraded reef and restore the reef itself. The current research to do this is um, one, improving those arms. Um, Linda Wigley, uh, who runs my lab with, uh, with me, and Kristen Marhaber, who was a PhD student at Scripps and now lives in Curacao, um, have been working on different geometries and materials and colors that attract more things to the arms. So can we improve the number of things that are actually living on the arms themselves and then um, we at SDSU and the, uh, uh, the Navy here in San Diego have been working on building the ARC prototypes. And right now we're doing things like deploying the ARCs off of San Diego because we can't travel to where there's a coral reef and um, just building them up and seeing uh, how they behave in the uh, water. Can they survive hurricane forces, things of that nature. And the goal is to deploy the first arcs in Curacao uh, this spring. All right, so let's go back to the viruses for a second. Um, there's, of course, um, all this interest in viral diversity, and that's been going on not just for uh, them in the environment, but of course, how they are uh, human pathogens or how they interact with the human. And the first shotgun sequencing that I told you about that led to all of these studies was done in 2002. And the second one that we actually did was of human feces in 2003. And uh, if you recall, that's actually when uh, SARS-1 happened. Um, it, it, it started in 2002. We didn't hear much about it in really until the peak activity in 2003. 
um, in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in particularly in Singapore and places like that, they got hit first. And um, one of the scientists from the Genomic Institute of Singapore actually came to SDSU to really figure out how to develop uh, metagenomics to find coronaviruses. So these are, um, and the challenge here is of course that the SARS viruses have an RNA genome instead of a DNA genome. It's a little harder for the sequencing, um, but we develop methods to do that. And this is uh, just some of the data from that because it's kind of fun. So we did the same thing. Um, I'll start, uh, uh, save you the details of uh, what it takes to filter and uh, purify viruses out of fecal matter because it's not very pleasant. But what you can do is you can get it away from everything else. So you just have the viral concentrates. And then we were uh, built RNA libraries and then we sent those to uh, Singapore to sequence. So this is out of human feces and we're trying to find out what are the normal RNA viruses associated with humans. And we got a big surprise because it turns out that human, the RNA viruses associated from, uh, with humans are actually all plant viruses. And they're really common uh, in our stool samples. And the most common is one that's called the pepper mild model or mosaic virus, PMMV. And we saw this in all of the samples that uh, we did this, um, uh, this analysis on. And it's a very common virus in the human uh, stool. It's basically in uh, about uh, 70 to 80% of the individuals that we've looked at. Um, and individuals that don't have PMMV have other uh, plant viruses. And the, it turns out that they get actually concentrated in the feces. So you take in food um, and we just looked at how much food uh, you, you're taking in and just look for the virus. You see very small signals and these things actually get concentrated as they move through your digestive system because they're resistant to digestion. And I'll show you in just a second that they actually pass uh, right through, our, uh, through us and then uh, go out in the feces where they can actually infect plants. And this is kind of fun for everybody that's from San Diego or Singapore. Um, because it turns out that we eat lots of peppers. And these pepper viruses that are in humans are actually not in the fresh peppers because when the virus infects the, the pepper plant, it kind of changes the shape of it and makes it uh, not look like a pepper you would buy. Um, so what happens is that all the peppers um, that get this virus get put into pepper sauces, so like curries and different anything that has lots of chilies and everything. And so what we did find is um, that really the main source is all of our chili sauces and so forth are just chuck full of this PMMV virus. And this is uh, the, just showing you that if you take a human fecal sample and you do the viral concentrates, get rid of everything else, you can get the uh, virus to infect. So these things are just using us as like a vector for getting around. Okay. But we actually did get a, a method going to look at RNA viruses. Um, and so roughly uh, what we've done for the human uh, viral associations is look at uh, adult fecal, um, which are mostly phage. And then the RNA viruses are actually dominated by plant viruses. Um, babies are born sterile and they acquire their viruses uh, almost immediately. And they uh, are definitely in the breast milk, so we can see them in the breast milk. And they're acquired, uh, and, and of course, the skin. So when the baby is suckling, they're getting uh, their first bolus of viruses and bacteria that way. And then we've also looked at just systemically, are they in the blood? And humans are chock full of not only viruses on um, kind of external, like in your gut and so forth, um, but also in your blood. So the, uh, the uh, protocol here is you just take whole blood, you get plasmids, uh, plasma, you uh, concentrate the viruses, and then again, you're gonna do that shotgun sequencing, so the metagenomics, to see what sorts of viruses um, are in the plasma of blood. And I should just say these are healthy humans. Um, 
These are some micrographs of them. They all kind of look, uh, uh, these are ones that would be more like a eukaryote, a virus that infects a eukaryotic cell. We see phages. And then if you just look at the se sequence similarity of them, um, one of the main things I would point out is that everybody basically has these TTV viruses. They're extremely common. I would say about 99% of the samples that we've ever looked at have different TTV viruses. Everybody carries multiple herpes viruses. Um, these infect different uh, cell types. Um, we all know about the sexually transmitted ones and the ones that cause uh, cold sores, but there's also a whole bunch of them that are uh, infecting different tissue types in the body. We see lots of uh, viruses that are most closely related to phage, so uh, that infect internal parasites like chlamydia. There are definitely rabies viruses and pox-like viruses are also common. And the other thing that's uh, really striking is that there's a significant greater than about 10% of the viruses we find in humans um, in the blood are completely unknown also. So they, they're not as unknown as what we find in the uh, environment, but there's still a lot of unknown viruses in healthy humans. Um, this led to what was called the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative, uh, which it was run by Nathan Wolf. The idea here was to really determine the viriomes of, uh, so the, the viruses, uh, we call that a viriome, of human animals, and in particular, um, uh, looking at uh, ones that, potential places that you would get spillovers from. So bushmeat, which you've, uh, we've all been hearing about because of the, the bad uh, uh, coronavirus uh, connection, but we've also looked at mosquitoes and things like that. Um, and then the, the goal, of course, is to really identify new viral pathogens um, uh, uh, in a very short period of time. And nowadays, they, there are these sorts of initiatives literally all over the world. So people are basically using these tools just to get, fight, figure out where viruses, um, what viruses are there and trace them very quickly in diseases. And to show you how well it's working is that it really only took about a month for uh, the uh, Chinese to identify the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and get the full genome. It was really super fast. And so these methods are, are doing really, uh, they're, they're, they've really helped revolutionize our way of looking at viruses. Okay. So that brings me to just the very last part, which is that the idea of um, really looking at what's going on with SARS-2 uh, here in San Diego. And what we've been doing is looking at the environmental reservoirs. Are there environmental reservoirs of the uh, SARS-CoV-2? And um, there's two parts to this. Um, my part is to lead a, a group of uh, uh, citizen scientists and people in the lab to uh, gather uh, samples uh, from surfaces all over the city, and then uh, specifically check for um, the RNA, uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, um, and that's going well, and I'll show you some data from that. And the second part is actually a professor from, uh, uh, in mathematics at SDSU, who is an, uh, does a lot of modeling of how viruses uh, move around, named Naveen. And, He's uh, taking our data and really asking, um, are these, uh, these environmental reservoirs important at all for, uh, for COVID-19? Right. Um, the way it works um, is that we have a sample database where people enter data during the sample collection with uh, GPS coordinate. They take a picture of the set, what they've sampled, Etc. And we deliver a little kit to them that has a uh, uh, detergent for swabbing a sample and then or swabbing a surface, and then that goes into a, a a buffer system that stabilizes the RNA. That comes back to the lab, and then Marisa here has actually been really running this project um, solid since about <laughs> March of this year. And uh, she does the RNA isolations. And then we use uh, two different 
methods to verify whether there is uh, uh, SARS-2 in, um, in the samples. And then um, the other thing that we're, we're doing, um, we haven't spent as much time on this yet, of course, but um, what we'll do is we're just gonna sequence all of the RNA that is coming out of these samples. So this is called metatranscriptomics. It's just a way of telling um, uh, all of the RNA, including different RNA viruses that will be in the samples. And we'll probably do the DNA also. So this is uh, really what's uh, the, the status of this right now. So we've been collecting um, samples continuously since March. Um, the citizen scientists uh, in San Diego have uh, done a phenomenal job. They've collected um, 3,500 samples, which is amazing uh, to date. And this has been pretty continuous. So we have a really nice sampling of the city. And roughly speaking, this is, um, unpeer-reviewed data, of course, but uh, there are approximately one positive for SARS-CoV-2 out of 1,000 samples. So that gives you an occurrence rate of about 0.1%. Okay. Now to put that in context, over the same sampling uh, or the same time frame, uh, greater than 1% of the human population in San Diego has been uh, infected. It's probably uh, more like 5 uh, to 10%. Um, we don't really know for sure the numbers in the human population, but we know that this is an underestimation for sure. Um, so far, where we've really found it is uh, where we found on surfaces was uh, a household doorknob and one of the signaling um, lamppost things, you know, to cross the street. Um, that's the main two that we're really confident. So um, the take home message from this, I think uh, is important. You can think about what it means for you. Um, there, the, and I'll just say it this way, is that really you're, with something like COVID-19, uh, you're really trying to weigh your relative risk, right? So we're all gonna uh, be, have to deal with it. And I, the, the virology community really believes that this is basically passed uh, through the air. And there's more evidence, more and more evidence that it's not even really big droplets. It's just basically uh, uh, aerosols and so forth. So that's really kind of opposed to much of what people has been, uh, uh, the, the point of that is that masks are the main thing that you need to be considering um, for your own health and, and people around you. In the US, of course, you people have really pushed um, washing your hands, hand sanitizers, and, and frankly, uh, also pushing suboptical masks. So these masks, like a, a face covering is not a real mask, right? It's not meant to capture viruses. It does help uh, uh, keep the viruses next to the person that might be infected, but it doesn't actually protect you um, much from uh, someone who's not wearing a mask. Okay? So what we're trying to do is really uh, give it an idea of how common those are on surfaces. Um, I'm telling you that we think it's about 0.1%, so like one out of a, a thousand surfaces that you uh, interact with might have COVID-2 on it, uh, sorry, SARS-2 uh, on it. And, um, it, and then um, what that actually means for the way that you, uh, you think about how you go through your day, um, you have to use those numbers versus how many people are infected out there. What I would tell you is that everybody should uh, have uh, N95 or KN95 masks and wear them. It really is important. And um, right now, what we're all uh, really going to be interested in is looking um, in these samples in more detail for some of the other viruses that we expect to show up. Since we've got such a nice sampling of the city and some of these we would expect to be more common on surfaces because they tend to be transmitted uh, oral fecal or fecal oral. And with that, I'll uh, uh, just thank, there's of course a ton of people in the lab over the years that have done this work. The um, particularly uh, Linda Wigley Kelly, who um, uh, runs the lab with me, the, a lot of the work um, 
uh, for the coral reefs has been done really with the Barber Lab at UCLA, uh, Ferruz in Sri Lanka, and the Stuart, and, uh, Stuart Sandin and Jen Smith Labs at UC uh, uh, SIO. Uh, the Biomath Group does all of my modeling. Um, the Dorstein Lab, I hope I mentioned that they do all the metabolomics that I talked about, and then there's a lot of work uh, with the Smithsonian Institution. Then, of course, there's all these people that have helped sponsor it over the years, um, which I need to thank. The NSF is the one um, sponsoring the environmental sampling for COVID right now, and it's the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation who studied most of that or sponsored most of the coral reef work. Um, you can find more information if you're interested at these different websites uh, for um, the Coral Reef uh, Arc Project. The Viral Information Institute is a group of about 20 PIs at SDSU who work together on virus-related uh, uh, topics. And, um, and then there's, of course, my research lab. And then finally, um, just if you're interested, um, we're definitely looking for more volunteers. Um, and so if anybody is interested, this is the website uh, where you can sign up to be a volunteer and uh, help us to keep up this uh, citizen sampling, citizen science sampling in San Diego. And then if you're interested in either the uh, learning more about the viruses or uh, about the coral reef work, there are these two books. Um, this one, I think you have to buy off Amazon because I don't think we have it um, available for download. The Life and Coral Reefs, you can just download off my, uh, uh, my life, sorry, Life in the Phage World, you can just download off the website, uh, my lab website. 